Good morning. My name is Rhett Talbot. I'm coming to you today from the Philippines where I'm reporting on the marine aquarium trade and marine aquarium trade data as a special report to reefs.com. This is the third part in the series. Today we're going to be talking about the data that already exists, data that scientists from New England Aquarium and Roger Williams University in conjunction with NOAA and the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, they started to collect in 2009. That data was published earlier this summer and has proven incredibly valuable already to the aquarium trade. We're going to look at that data, look at some of its strengths and weaknesses, but most importantly we're going to talk about how that data has created a very firm foundation for the work that is occurring now in the Philippines. Before we can answer the question, why aquarium trade data matter, we must first understand the data about which we are talking. It'll be useful to understand where those data originate and how credible they are. The current story begins in 2009 when the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, teamed up with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and researchers from New England Aquarium and Roger Williams University in an effort to better understand the trade in marine aquarium animals. The partnership had its origins in a simple question. What are the effects of the marine aquarium trade on coral reefs? Landings data would be a good place to start when answering that question, but few of the more than 40 countries that supply marine fishes to the aquarium trade have credible aquarium fishery landing data. Without landings data, it's hard to know how many animals are harvested from reefs, so NOAA turned to the next best thing, trade data. While export data doesn't take into account mortality between landing and export, and as a result is not a perfect measure of how many fishes are taken from the reef, it is still very useful. Among other things, export data can reveal trends and identify areas where further study may be warranted. Unfortunately, credible export data from most source countries is not much better than their landings data. But import data in the United States is actually considerably better and easier to obtain. The gatekeeper for animals imported to the United States is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service collects paperwork associated with each shipment. This paperwork includes declaration forms, permits, and invoices. Unfortunately, the only import information traditionally databased by Fish and Wildlife is the declaration information. And unless an animal is listed under the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, and very few aquarium fishes are, the animal is generally listed by a single catch-all code. For example, all marine aquarium fishes, and there are more than 2,000 species imported to the U.S., are simply listed as MATF for Marine Aquarium Tropical Fish. While potentially knowing the total number of marine aquarium fishes entering the country is an interesting statistic, assessing the aquarium trade's effect on coral reefs really requires species-specific information. After all, importing 400,000 chromis is very different than importing 400,000 blue tang or 400,000 cleaner wrasses. Because U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service data lack a species-specific approach, NOAA turned to another document that accompanies imported shipments, the commercial invoice. The invoice is completed by the exporter in the source country and lists most fishes down to the species level. While the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service archives these invoices, they are not entered into any database. So the first step to using this data was to actually extract it into a usable form. In 2008, NOAA approached Dr. Andrew Ryan of Roger Williams University for help with the invoices. Ryan received shipment declarations and attached commercial invoices coded MATF for 2004, 2005, 2008, 2009, and 2011. Out of necessity, there were over 30,000 invoices. What started as a manual data entry project quickly became automated using optical character recognition software that Ryan and his team customized for wildlife shipments. Once the data were captured, they were verified and errors were corrected. This past summer, the data were made publicly available through a web-based graphical user interface called Marine Aquarium Trade Biodiversity and Trade Flow, which can be found at www.aquariumtradedata.org. Users can now query over 29,000 invoices containing over 2.7 million marine ornamental animal import records. Without question, it is the single best source of marine aquarium data ever published. While the database is the best available extant trade data, it does have its limitations. For example, it only represents four complete years of data, and those years were dominated by recession, suggesting the data might not reflect a quote-unquote normal trade volume. In addition, the data only represent imports to one country, the United States. 
Global volume and biodiversity need to be modeled based on the assumption that the U.S. represents between 50 and 70 percent of global trade. Finally, there is no way that researchers could independently verify that the commercial invoices accurately list the actual contents of the shipment. However, because the invoices are used for business purposes between exporter and importer, it is assumed they are fairly accurate. Acquiring data on marine aquarium fisheries and creating aquariumtradedata.org laid the critical groundwork for what is about to begin in the Philippines. What if export data could be easily collected from the largest source country for marine aquarium fishes using the same technology Ryan and his colleagues used to collect the U.S. import data? How could such technology assist the Philippines in their ongoing commitment to addressing IUU fishing? How could having credible third-party data be transformative to the saltwater aquarium trade? Could this approach be exported to other major source countries for the marine aquarium trade, countries like Indonesia and Sri Lanka? Could it be used to monitor more of the wildlife trade or even the seafood trade? These are all issues we will discuss, but first, in the next segment, we'll take a look at how the technology itself is being implemented in the Philippines. I invite you to continue to follow the special report to Reefs.com on the marine aquarium trade and marine aquarium trade data. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment below or email me directly at ret at I'm Rhett Talbot reporting from the Philippines. Thanks for watching.